This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again. It's the Human Action Podcast. This week, we are actually live video with our great friend, Professor Walter Block. If you've been following along, reading along, we have worked our way through Man, Economy, and State, Murray Rothbard's magnum opus, and we have worked through several chapters on production, and we have now finally arrived at chapter 10. Uh, to wit, Murray Rothbard devotes an entire lengthy chapter, pages 629 to 754, to monopoly and competition. And there's a lot going on in this chapter, Dr. Block. Uh, it's a seminal chapter. It, it changed the landscape for monopoly theory and price theory. Uh, he went up against his mentor, Mises, in a sense, in this chapter. So I just want to take some time and discuss it at length. And, and through the magic of Zoom, you're going to draw us some diagrams today, even maybe. So first of all, how the hell are you, Walter, during all this pandemic? I'm, I'm hanging in there. I'm getting more work done than ordinarily because I, I, for the first six weeks, I was sort of self-confined. I had yeah. nothing to do but write. And uh, now I've been getting out a little bit, but still I've been doing more writing and reading than otherwise. So um, I'm a happy camper. Well, not fully happy. Who could be happy with this situation? One with the COVID and the other with the crazy government. But uh, personally, in terms of you know production, I'm okay. Well, let's start with a little background. First of all, the history and the setting. Murray's writing this in the 1950s. So what was, you know, very briefly, what was sort of the state of the neoclassical view of monopoly and what was the Misesian view of monopoly when, when Murray's writing this? Both were not good. Uh, the, the state of the uh, neoclassical uh, Friedmanite uh, Chicago view was that the uh, a uh, monopoly is part of the market, and it's a market failure, and the government has got to get in there and fix it up, and it can do so in three ways. One is um, by regulating, because uh, the monopolist is charging too much and producing too little, and therefore uh, the government should get the monopolist to produce more and charge a lower price. That's one possibility. The second possibility is to uh, nationalize it. Uh, you know, the government just takes over because it's a market failure and government is here to help us. You know, I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. And uh, that's the way uh, they're going to help them. And uh, so that was very bad. Uh, then Mises was much better than the, the neoclassical. He only uh, said that there could be a monopoly in natural resources. And I remember, you know, I used to hang around with Murray in his living room. And I remember he was telling a bunch of us, I forget who was in the room, maybe Joe Salerno and um, uh, I don't know, um, uh, uh, Leonard Liggio and, and Joe, uh, 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 um, ah, I forget all the people. But he said that the first time that he publicly criticized Mises, he was very, I won't say scared, but uh, maybe upset or unhappy. And I mean, he looked at Mises as, as a god, and that's roughly the way you and I, if I can speak for you, look at Murray. And, you know, to criticize God, uh, I, I hope I'm not being irreligious here. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but to criticize somebody that you revere is, um, is rough. And Murray uh, said that uh, one of the first times that he ever criticized Mises was on this issue. So that's sort of a little bit of a background uh, on, on this issue that, um, uh, that Murray uh, made, um, uh, how shall I say it, veered off the Misesian path and certainly veered off the uh, mainstream path. And uh, uh, oh, but I forgot the third way that the government says is we should have antitrust and break them up. Mm -hmm. So it's either nationalize, regulate, or break them up into 72,000 little companies. And that would be the, I, I forgot the third way that the, the neoclassicists would say deal with monopoly. But uh, Murray re certainly rejected the um, mainstream view, the neoclassical view, as did Mises. And he also rejected the Misesian view, which had a very limited uh, uh, scope for monopoly on, on natural resources and stuff like that. So um, th this is a big, big breakthrough. It's very, very important. A lot of, a lot of this stuff uh, doesn't have immediate effects, but this has got big effects on antitrust. 
And then Murray did all sorts of good re uh, historical research. And he would say, well, you know, uh, there was the Rockefellers and the Morgans. And when the Rockefeller president was in, what they did is they used antitrust on the Morgan companies. And then when the Morgan president was in, they used antitrust on the Rockefeller companies. And you had all sorts of uh, chicanery and politics. And, you know, the most recent one is, um, what was it, uh, uh, Bill Gates out in, in, um, uh, in the boonies in, in Seattle. And he wasn't paying off anyone. I mean, he was just, you know, creating stuff and, and they started antitrust on him. Uh, you know, how else are they going to get him? Uh, you know, they can't tax him more than anyone else because that would be invidious and discriminatory. But they said, well, you're a monopolist. We're going to come get you. And then uh, Bill Gates started paying off the boys in Washington. And all of a sudden, uh, there was no, um, no antitrust. And then uh, IBM. IBM, when it started, it was the only producer. And monopoly, monopoly means single seller in, in Latin or Greek or whatever it is. And uh, they had a 20 year case against IBM. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bill Gates is starting and you know, everybody else is starting and they're still bugging IB, poor IBM. So this is, uh, I'm not saying that other things in Austrian economics and other things uh, that Murray has done don't have real world implications, certainly gold and business cycles and a lot of stuff uh, do, but like uh, some of the previous chapters that you talked about in Man, Economy and State aren't as um, political as this one. Mm -hmm. This one is way more political than many of the other chapters on, you know, what's wrong with the difference curves or how do you do uh, cost and stuff like that. So interestingly, Rothbard takes issue with the term consumer sovereignty, which Mises used and which had been popularized by Hutt. Uh, Murray thought it was, a, it was a political term, not an economics term. So talk about that. Yes, uh, Murray was excellent on that. You know, um, uh, what he said was uh, individual sovereignty. What's with this consumer? Who's, what's so great about the consumer? It's almost Keynesian to focus on the consumer. Uh, individual sovereignty, we should all be sovereign. We should be sovereign, yes, yes. He, he's not against consumer sovereignty, but how about producer sovereignty? Why shouldn't producers be sovereign also? We're, we're all, um, you know, human beings and human beings have rights and we should all be sovereign. And you know, I, I sometimes like to link this up with his anarchy thing. And uh, for Murray, what's the ideal number of countries? Seven and a half billion. <laughs> we, should, we should each have one. So it's sort of a strange uh, thing for an anarchist to say that he's in favor of countries. But yes, he's in favor of many, many countries. We should each have one. And if you ask a girl for a date, you just can't ask her for a date. You have to go through your foreign minister to talk to her foreign minister. Uh, I'm just being silly here. But the, the point that Murray was making, I think absolutely correctly, was that um, uh, why only consumer sovereignty? So he wasn't against consumer sovereignty, but he wanted to have producer sovereignty also and, and anyone else sovereignty, you know, uh, violinist sovereignty or a basketball player sovereignty or everybody should be sovereign. Namely, nobody should be um, uh, subject to archy, un, unjustified rule. So, yes, uh, this is another um, big breakthrough uh, where that. Uh, Murray made and, and uh, in contravention to uh, Hutt and, and other people who were, you know, pretty good. Hutt, Hutt was a very good Austrian economist, but, you know, we all have, uh, none of us is perfect. Uh, we all put our pants on one leg at a time and all. And uh, Hutt, I, I'm not trying to diminish Hutt. Uh, uh, and it wasn't just Hutt. And this was a, a concept in, in all of economics. And, and Murray uh, was foremost in um, obliterating it. So, Walter, Rothbard starts with sort of the three definitions or the three identifications of monopoly, one of which is where there's a single seller. Of course, that's what we think of as a monopoly. Uh, he also goes into when there's a state privilege, which we'll get into later in terms of patent and copyright, for example, uh, regulation. And then but the third kind, which is maybe most interesting for our discussion today, is when somehow a business unit achieves a monopoly price on its own. So talk about definitionally as Austrians, how should we be thinking about this? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, Murray, again, is uh, making a, a, a very important point. First of all, the single seller. I'm a single seller of Walter Block services. You're a single seller of uh, uh, Jeff uh, Deist services. We're all single sellers of um, uh, unique. We're all unique. We're all different. Um, uh, and that sense of monopoly is um, almost silly because, you know, uh, we're all monopoly. <laughs> what do they say we're, it, we're all monopolists now in the single seller sense. 
The very important sense is this um, uh, government privilege. That's the way monopoly started. Uh, in England, you know, the Duke of uh, London fights the good battle against the, the King of France or something, and now he's awarded the uh, cannel monopoly. And uh, he's got the cannel monopoly, say, just in London. Doesn't mean you can't make candles in London, but you have to go to him for permission. And he'll say, okay, sure, you can make candles, but you have to pay me, you know, half of this or whatever. And if you try to make candles uh, without the, the Duke's monopolist permission, well, you know, uh, you go to jail or you get punished. One of my favorite um, uh, parts of the movie Gandhi was when they were all marching up to the ocean to try to get water to make salt, and then the, the, the police were bopping them over the head. What, what was that all about? What was that all about is that the, the English government, the British government, uh, gave monopoly privileges to somebody, and Gandhi didn't much like that, and uh, Gandhi was uh, trying to demonstrate that this is unfair. Well, that is a very, very sensible understanding of monopoly. And uh, even the neoclassicals would include that as monopoly. Uh, and uh, th this is just a, a grant of government privilege and it, it's certainly incompatible with freedom and, and with um, uh, free enterprise. And there's no question about that. And you have modern cases of that, for example, a taxi cab medallion. If you uh, try to drive a cab in New York City and you don't have a medallion, they'll arrest you. And then you had the, the some sort of the gypsy cabs and mm -hmm. because the cabs weren't going to black areas, so the black people started driving cabs and you had all sorts of problems. And now with Uber, they won't allow Uber to work in some places. Well, that gives uh, the taxi cab people a monopoly or Airbnb. The hotels don't much like Airbnb, so they're trying to get a monopoly there. So we do have, and the monopoly of that that sort is uh, rife throughout the economy. Uh, young black girls want to do hair braiding and um, they're told, well, you, you have to get a license, which is a monopoly in, in effect. And, and you just can't hair braid, uh, uh, do, braid people's hair. You have to go and study for 20 years or something. I'm exaggerating. Uh, doctors are a monopoly. Um, uh, monopoly is rife throughout the economy. And uh, certainly all libertarians would oppose monopoly on that ground. Now, there were some libertarians who were uh, not Austrians, and they would, uh, they would have a problem with the third uh, uh, point, namely achieving um, monopoly price. And now, in order to illustrate that, I'd like to uh, use uh, uh, the blackboard or the whiteboard here. Um, and what Murray is saying there is, how the hell do you know what the monopoly price is? The whole thing is ridiculous. Uh, so I'm first going to do a very simple um, monopoly diagram. And this is called a Corno uh, Oasis, uh, water, uh, water Oasis. And here's the quantity of water. And, uh, there, uh, and here is the price. And here is the demand curve for water. And here is the marginal revenue curve for water, which has got twice the slope, if I can draw this accurately. And uh, this is the marginal revenue curve. My handwriting is a little problematic, but doing the best I can. And uh, this axis over here is really uh, not only the quantity of water, but it's also marginal cost and average cost uh, because uh, the, the situation here is you own the oasis and I come along with a pot and I, uh, it costs you nothing. Uh, and, and we uh, assume away all the costs of collection, uh, just to make it simple. Namely, I'm honest and I'll pay you whatever the price is. A gallon of water is two bucks. I'll put the two bucks in, in, your, um, in your collection bin and I'll take the water and I won't take more water. I won't cheat and I, I'll give you the money. So it costs you nothing. So what would be the perfect competitive uh, place? The perfect competitive place would be right here. And this would be the quantity of competition. That's how much the competitive industry would charge for water, zero. Because in perfect competition, there are no profits. And when there are no profits um, uh, and the, there are zero costs, well, the price has to be zero. So that's the quantity of uh, the competition that's supposed to be a C right there. And here is the price of the competition, namely zero. And all is, all is well uh, from the mainstream point of view. Now, 
how how do you figure out what the monopolist charges? Well, the monopolist charges where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. That's uh, how he figures out the, um, the what do you call it? The, the quantity and where marginal cost and marginal revenue meet. Uh, right there, and then we uh, move up to the demand curve because uh, we've decided how much we want to produce, and this is the M point, and this is the quantity of the monopolist, and this is the price that the monopolist charges. And this is mainstream, straightforward stuff. I mean, sure. if some neoclassical economists were looking at this, he would say, yeah, you know, that's, that's right. Maybe the handwriting is, isn't as good as it should be, but uh, that's right. And uh, the indictment here is fourfold. First, uh, the first part of the indictment is that the price of the monopolist is higher than the price of the competitor. And here's where Murray uh, comes in and he says, well, you know, how do you know? All, all you know is that there's this guy, uh, say IBM or Bill Gates or somebody, they're charging a price. How do you know it's a monopoly price? And then it goes into the elasticity of the demand curve and uh, all sorts of complications. But the, the, key element, the key element, the first indictment is the price is too high. The second indictment of monopoly is that the quantity of the monopolist is less than the quantity of the competitor. And somehow we should have more quantity. Don't ask me why. Why more quantity better than less quantity? I mean, if you have more quantity of uh, violins, you have to have less quantity of shoes. And we don't want more quantity of any one thing. What we want is the proper allocation of shoes and violins or whatever uh, items or water and something else. So that's the, the second indictment. The third indictment is that the profit of the competitor profit of the competitor equals zero. And the profit of the monopolist, the profit, uh, we usually use pi as an indication is greater than zero. And we can, and, and somehow profits are evil. You know, <laughs> give me a break. Uh, well, where are the profits? Well, the profits are this box. This box is uh, the profits uh, that I'm shading in. And uh, somehow profits are evil. and. Uh, um, we, the monopolist shouldn't have profits. And th this is interesting for the libertarian point of view, you know, what's wrong with profits? We make profits every time we uh, engage in, um, in economic activity. I bought this shirt for 10 bucks and I valued it at more, otherwise I wouldn't have bought it. Uh, let's say I valued it at 11. I made a dollar profit off of it. And the guy who sold it to me valued it two dollars because he had tons of them. And he's trying to get rid of them, and he sold it to me for ten. He made a profit of eight dollars. We each exploited the other. We each made a profit off each other. Okay. Uh, and then the fourth, and uh, for the neoclassical, the most powerful um, uh, indictment is a thing called dead weight loss. And I'm not going to spell that out because it would take me forever. Dead weight loss. Uh, dead weight loss, uh, the idea, and, and this triangle here is dead weight loss. Right. Dead weight loss. The idea is that we value this extra water, the area under the demand curve. It costs us nothing, and yet it's not being produced. And uh, this is uh, anathema. I mean, uh, th th these guys go berserk when they hear dead weight loss. That's a market failure par excellence. I mean, you know, uh, the government's got to get in there. And, um, you know, Murray is saying that the whole thing is nonsense. And uh, let me explain why the whole thing is nonsense. Uh, uh, and maybe in a more deep way, forget about water. Suppose this is Mike Tyson. And this is number of fights that he does per year. And Mike Tyson only wants to fight 10 fights per year. I think that's roughly what he fought. And somehow the antitrust people want Mike Tyson to charge, uh, to charge, to play, to fight 20 times a year. Because they've drawn these uh, diagrams and they know better than Mike. And <clears throat> I mean, this is obviously ludicrous because, you know, you, you get the problem of ICU. Um, I now have grandchildren, very young grandchildren. I would go peekaboo, ICU, but ICU here is very different. ICU means here interpersonal comparison utility. What you're really comparing is Mike Tyson's, look, every time Mike Tyson fought, it's true he won, but he got 
bopped in the head and, you know, punched. And he doesn't want to fight 20 times a year. He only wants to fight 10. And the antitrust people are, are saying, no, no, Mike, you got to go fight 20. You know, otherwise we'll what? Nationalize you or or regulate you or break you up into little pieces? Well, that, that wouldn't work, but uh, they could regulate. I mean, if they adopted the, the policy of antitrust and they applied it to Mike Tyson or or a singer or, or you know, any or, or you, Jeff, I mean, you give um, uh, 10 lectures a month. And we want you to give 20 lectures a month. And, and you say, but my throat will go and my voice will go. And we say, how would you? You don't know your throat. and We know better. Uh, that's roughly what's going on here. And the key is um, that if, if this monopolist is sold, the, the new average cost curve will be up here. And um, people will uh, still misallocate resources. In other words, even if the monopoly is sold, now there'll be no profit. Because uh, let's say it's sold at a price that um, uh, reflects the present discounted value of the monopoly uh, profits. There'll be no profit, uh, but still prices will be too high, quantity will be too low, and there'll be a dead weight loss. So even if the monopolist is sold, then, then you get rid of this one, but you have the other three indictments. So th this is sort of um, a geographic geographical, uh, graphical uh, depiction of it. Uh, a more fancy way of doing this would be, uh, wait, I want to erase everything, clear all drawings. And now this would be a more sophisticated version, um, or maybe before I, I do the more sophisticated version that you would see in the intermediate textbooks, um, maybe I'll take a break and um, <laughs> let, you have a, <laughs> let you have a turn. Well, I just want to go back very briefly to your Mike Tyson example. Now, Mike Tyson is a very specific good. There's not a lot of Mike Tysons out there. And in your example of, let's say, an oasis or a water cellar, uh, I, I just wonder how conceptually, because I know what critics are going to say, conceptually, how should we think about this in terms of spatial orientation? In other words, if you go to a small town, let's say there's one Dairy Queen, and let's say eating out is uh, very, very different from buying groceries and cooking it yourself. Let's say those are two very different goods. And so the Dairy Queen's the only restaurant. And spatially, it takes a long time to drive to the next town. You're in a rural part of America. I, I, I just wanted to understand how you and, and Rothbard would think about this spatial orientation. Well, it's not only the spatial, it's also how do you define it? For example, if you define um, um, uh, the, you see, the, the key is concentration ratio. A monopoly has 100% of the industry. Well, what the hell is the industry? Mm -hmm. Is the industry dry breakfast cereals? Well, if the industry is dry breakfast cereals, you're going to have a high concentration rate. And the plaintiff is going to say, yes, it's dry breakfast cereals. And therefore, we should have antitrust, whether it's the plaintiff, a private plaintiff who's trying to complain about Kellogg's or the government, they're going to have the industry very narrow. The defense is going to say, no, 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 the industry really isn't just dry breakfast cereals. It's also uh, cooked breakfast cereals. And not only cooked breakfast cereals, but uh, uh, all food. Now, if, you, if the industry is all food, well, then the uh, concentration ratio is very low. Well, what's right? Is, should it be breakfast cereals dry, uh, uh, wet breakfast cereals, all breakfast stuff, all food? It's arbitrary and capricious. And it's the same thing with the point you're making geographically. Namely, it's the same thing, whether it's geographic or industry definition. Namely, well, how far do you have to go? Uh, if the, there's a Dairy Queen um, uh, 30 miles away, is that a monopolist? How about 25 miles away? How about 10 miles away? How about five miles away? How about uh, across the street? You know, where do you draw the line? And this is important stuff because people can go to jail for this. People can be fined for this. Uh, people can lose their livings. And, and from an intellectual point of view, it's sort of like without a basis. I mean, you know, if I uh, shoot somebody, well, you know, I shot somebody. The, it's clear. But am I, am I a monopolist? Well, it depends upon how you define the industry. And there's no right way to define the industry, Murray would say. And, and also, uh, geographically, how far does the next competitor have to be for there to be a monopoly? Well, you don't get that out of the theory. They just sort of make it up as they go along. 
the whole thing is arbitrary and capricious. I mean, law, you know, you're supposed to know if you're obeying a law, a just law, you know whether you're obeying the law. You know, if I shoot somebody or somebody punches me, we know that you violated the law. And if I'm, we're just sitting here talking, well, we're not violating the law. Well, I now open up a business and I get uh, bigger and bigger and, and I don't know if I'm a monopolist. Well, you know, I don't know with the best intentions. In other words, suppose I believed in this crap. I still wouldn't know whether I'm a monopolist or not. Well, what kind of a law is that? It's just very arbitrary and capricious. So I, I, I think you make a very good point about the geographical distance. And Murray also makes the point about, well, how do you define the industry? All right. So let's see your intermediate graph. Okay. The intermediate graph is we now have... Um, uh, the same uh, uh, axes, namely quantity here, and we have price here. Only now uh, we have a average cost curve that looks like that. It's a U-shaped average cost curve. And we have a marginal cost curve that looks like this, and it intersects the average cost curve at the bottom of it. And there is marginal cost. And here we have a, a demand curve. And the demand, oh boy, that's a messy demand curve. Uh, let me see if I could just clear, clear that up. Uh, okay, I'll I'll, ju I'll just make the demand curve this way, and I hope everyone. Hey, it's sloping was... down. You got that? It's sloping down. We're at. Oh wait, this could be the marginal revenue curve. There we go. So we're not too bad. Okay, so this is a more sophisticated uh, view of. Um, uh, and, and you'll find this in every intermediate micro text to illustrate the evils of monopoly. Well, where does the perfect competitor um, end up? The perfect competitor ends up at point C, where supply, this is really a supply here, where supply uh, hits demand. And uh, this would be the quantity of the uh, perfect competitor. And this would be the price that the perfect competitor charges. And we get that by uh, zipping along here. And how do we get um, the um, monopoly price and quantity and profit and, and dead weight loss and all that? Well, uh, first you, you choose quantity where marginal cost hits marginal revenue. Well, here's marginal cost, here's marginal revenue. Where do they hit? They hit right there. So that is the quantity of the monopolist. And notice that the quantity of monopolist is less than the quantity of the perfect competition. And how do we get the price? Well, we go up to the demand curve. We extend the line up to the demand curve, and this is M, where the monopolist locates, and this is the, the price that the monopolist charges. And again, you have the same four indictments. First, the uh, quantity of the monopolist is too uh, little. He's monopolistically withholding. Like Mike Tyson, he was withholding. Jeff, you were withholding. You only do uh, 10 lectures a week, you dirty, rotten kid. You you should do 20. If you had any decency, you would do 20. But you, you're withholding your monopolistic elements or efforts, as is Mike Tyson, as is this company here. They are withholding the distance between QM and QC, uh, those rotten kids. Second indictment is that, and here Murray uh, again uh, talks about the price of the monopolist is higher than the price of the competition. I, I, I once got into a debate with a, um, uh, on this issue, and the guy said, well, look, whatever the monopolist is charging, we don't know for sure, but just make them charge less. Well, <laughs> if that's the rule, then the monopolist is going to charge way up here. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. And and sure. he'll say, OK, sure. Let, lower me back to PM because I want to be at PM anyway. I mean, the, the whole thing is is sort of um, uh, I don't know. What do they say? Um, nonsense on stilts or, or, or something like that. Uh, so the price is arbitrary, but the price is too high. The third one is, well, where's profits? Well, the competitor makes no profits. Where's the profits of the monopolist? The profits of the monopolist is this box right here because you, um, uh, you have to go from average cost and that, that would be profit similar to what I drew before. And now where's the dead weight loss? This is, I'm not gonna do DWL, but I'll put D. This triangle here is the dead weight loss uh, because we value the stuff at this rate. It only costs us this much. Therefore, the difference, um, uh, the difference is dead weight loss. Now I have to bring in my favorite economist, 
not really, I'm kidding, Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman is very sophisticated about this stuff. He says, ta ta ta, just because, you see, uh, the mainstream economist, the non Friedman esque one, and Friedman is, you know, he's a bright guy. The mainstream guy says, look, there's a dead weight loss, therefore you have to have antitrust. That would be the mainstream view. Friedman says, ta ta ta, not so fast. I'm paraphrasing, of course, uh, because antitrust costs money too. You have to have judges, you have to have lawyers, you have to have uh, court reporters, you have to have real estate. It, you know, it, it's not a cheap thing. So uh, Friedman's um, free enterprise Friedman is saying, yes, we have to have antitrust, but only when the dead weight loss is greater than the cost of stopping it. And there's a certain low cunning here, a certain coherence. I mean, you know, uh, given that you believe in, in this stuff, well, then Friedman's point is, is very well taken. The whole point is that Friedman is a neoclassical. He's not a, um, an Austrian uh, follower of Murray on this issue. And therefore, he, uh, he starts with a, a false premise. But if you grant him the false premise, then what he's saying is reasonable. It, it costs some money to have antitrust. Antitrust is a pain in the neck. It costs money. And, and think of the full employment uh, uh, opportunities for economists starting to measure this stuff. I mean, thank God for Milton Friedman, all of us economists are going to have jobs forever. Because right now I'm just drawing curves on, on, a, on a blackboard or on a whiteboard. But uh, with, with the, the Friedman-esque um, uh, twist on this, uh, all of a sudden, um, uh, we have to measure these curves. We have to do a lot of econometrics. We have to do research, and you know, uh, the BLS Bureau of Labor Statistics, and, and all these. Um, Murray once wrote this magnificent, very short little gem of an article. I think it was called "Statistics: Government's Achilles Heel," something like that, where he was saying, you know, if a businessman wants statistics, he'll go and buy them. He'll, uh, you know, he'll do the research. But uh, this stuff, uh, when the government does it, it, it's sort of like a carte blanche for economists, because now, you know, we can sound very profound. Well, according to the, you know, the Commerce Department, they said, well, there are these many industries, and, and now we have three-digit industries, and we have different concentration ratios, and, and we have all sorts of um, great stuff like that. So this would be a more sophisticated version of the, uh, of the Oasis water selling, but it's the same nonsense. Well, I want to touch on a couple points that people make, one of which is huge firms like Walmart and the problems they might have internally. The other thing is cartels when multiple firms come together. And it's interesting, Rothbard touches here in this chapter. There's also a letter that's reprinted in Guido Holzman's biography of Mises, The Last Night of Liberalism, where Rothbard points out, you know, a cartel isn't all that different conceptually from just a bunch of people getting together and pooling their money, issuing shares and calling that a corporation. But yet there's this, this pervasive sense in, in America, even today, when legal scholars would say antitrust is at sort of a low ebb. But nonetheless, there's this pervasive sense that these big cartels get together and sort of set the price. So talk, talk about big corporations and cartels. Okay, first, um, uh, Walmart uh, in New Orleans, uh, they just put in a Walmart all about five years ago. And before that, every lefty forever, you know, oh, Walmart is evil, you know, they're too big, they're, they, they, they don't have uh, good medical coverage, they pay low salaries, they'll knock out the mom and pop stores. And, 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 and people were, you know, the lefties were, were just adamant that it won't, I don't think Walmart is allowed in New York City. I'm not sure about that, but I think they're not allowed there because, you know, they made some sort of rule that if you're a certain size, you can't come into New York City. And I think in Canada, they're having, no, in Canada, what happened is that they had a strike and then Walmart just uh, uh, got out of Canada. Uh, so now I shop at Walmart and every worker in Walmart is bl black or African-American, whatever the expression is, and half the customers are black. When they opened up, finally, after the, going through hoops for years uh, where the city government wouldn't allow them to open, they advertised for 400 workers. They wanted 400 employees. And there was 4,000 people that wanted those jobs, those crappy jobs, you know. 
Uh, so, you know, Walmart is a blessing. Uh, Walmart is magnificent. You know, one-stop shopping. You, you can buy toothpaste. You can buy, uh, I don't know, shoes. You, you can't buy a violin, I don't think. But, you know, <laughs> you can pretty much buy anything. It, it, it saves time. It saves uh, consumer sovereignty, you know, will be better, uh, better that way and, and producer sovereignty. So, uh, you know, just bigness is... Uh, nothing wrong with the bigness, uh, you know, and, and, you know, there are still small uh, places because Walmart isn't open 24 seven. And, you know, there are small places like you go get gas and uh, the, there's a, a little grocery there and, uh, you know, you pick up um, uh, whatever, a beer or something. So uh, just because a company is a big company, uh, th there's nothing uh, wrong with that. Now, cartels. Cartels have got a bad reputation, especially if you talk about Mexican drug cartels, but that's a different kind of cartel. Uh, that's, uh, you know, those cartels uh, use uh, machine guns and fight with the Mexican uh, government on roughly equal terms. Uh, th that's a different kind of a cartel. Uh, uh, Murray's point is, look, you know, the, the mainstream view of cartels is very different than Murray's view. Murray is absolutely correct. The mainstream view is that cartels are subject to dissolution from internal and external sources. In other words, if a, if a, here is, uh, we can use this monopoly diagram. According to the mainstream, what the, the cartel is, they're all located here and they want to locate there. And uh, right now they're, uh, they're producing 20 units each and they want to okay. produce 10 units each because if they can, if the elasticities are right and, and the, um, uh, the thing is roughly inelastic between these two points, well, then you'll have uh, more revenue at the higher point than at the lower point. So uh, each cartel owner agrees to cut out half of his production. And now we'll go from point C over here to point M and we'll make more and we'll make profit instead of losses. And what the mainstream says, well, this is a subject to uh, uh, cheating internally because each person will say, yes, let everyone else cut back from 10 to 20, from 20 to 10. I'll cut back from 20 to 15 or from 20 to 19 and I'll uh, piggyback on everyone else. But everyone is thinking that and everyone is trying to cheat. And then you have a question, well, uh, would a cartel agreement be legal? Namely, uh, uh, Jeff, you and I are part of this cartel, and you, you dirty rat, are only uh, uh, cutting back from 20 to 19. Uh, can I sue you? Is this a legitimate uh, contract? And th that's a whole uh, libertarian issue. I, I, I don't see anything wrong with that. If you agree to do it, well, you know, mm -hmm. collateral didn't pass hand. So it's a very complicated issue as to whether you can. Uh, but on the economics, it's subject to break up uh, internally and also externally. Because if we go from PC up here, uh, to PM, people from outside are going to start producing this product. So uh, the mainstream people are saying, well, you know, um, uh, cartels are subject to dissolution, so let's not worry about them. Murray is saying, look, uh, nothing wrong with a cartel. <laughs> the cartel is great. You know, I'm, I'm working on defending three now, and, and I forgot to put the cartel list in there. I'm, I'm going to stick them in there. Thanks to you. <laughs> Well, is a, uh, is a labor union a form of a cartel? It doesn't try to reduce profits, but it tries to reduce participants in the, on the supply side. Yeah, but, well, the, Murray, ha, uh, Murray has a brilliant um, uh, aspect, um, part of, of this chapter also on labor unions. Look, there's nothing wrong with labor unions uh, reducing the size if they do it voluntarily. And, and this is Murray's point. But what the labor union does is, you know, uh, you're a scab. You're trying to get in on this and we're going to beat you up or something. Or we're going to get the government to pass a law saying that you can't come in and compete with us. Well, that's a, a very uh, different uh, kind of a thing. So, yes, um, uh, labor unions are a cartel. But and Murray would defend cartels. As long as they don't use violence to keep out scabs or, you know, uh, competitors or go to the government like um, uh, like uh, the taxi people go and try to get Uber um, uh, prohibited. And, and in many cities, Uber can't uh, uh, Uber is illegal because they passed this law. So Murray is saying, look, uh, a cartel is uh, yes, it, it, it is subject to break up uh, from internal or external. But, you know, if it succeeds, well, it's, it's a monopoly, nothing wrong with a monopoly. And therefore, ergo, nothing wrong with, uh, with the cartel. Walter, I just want to bring up something that Rothbard 
posits, which is that even in theory, even in the purely theoretical plane, demand curves slope downward. So can we go back to your diagram and just help us conceptualize that? Well, here's a downward sloping demand curve. Yeah, demand curves uh, typically slope downward. Now, th there are uh, fancy schmancy people who talk about, what is it, the Giffen good, where the mm -hmm. demand curve slopes upward. And, and uh, that's nonsense because uh, uh, the, the proper demand curve is one where the only thing that changes is price and quantity. Whereas the uh, the given good is based on, well, you know, as price falls from this point to this point, income rises. Mm -hmm. And if if it's an inferior good, a very inferior good, well, the uh, income effect will outweigh the substitution effect and you could get a uh, uh, an upward sloping demand curve, but uh, only an upward sloping demand curve for a non-kosher demand curve. If you had a kosher demand curve, uh, this couldn't happen because everything else is supposed to be constant along the demand curve. And on the neoclassical demand curve, income is allowed to change. And what kind of, well, of course, if you had that kind of a demand curve, well, then it, it theoretically could occur. And, and the example they give is the Irish potato famine uh, kind of a thing where potatoes were a, a big part of the, the diet and uh, uh, and the demand curve could go upward, but you know, if you and uh, you could have a diminishing supply curve too. And then, if you had a, a demand curve and a supply curve where this was the demand curve and this was the supply curve, uh, prices would rise up to infinity or fall down to negative infinity if you had um, a crazy demand curve like that. But you're asking not about upward sloping demand curves, you're asking about flat demand curves, right? Uh, infinite. Well, th that that's a problem because uh, eventually, if you had a flat demand curve, and here's quantity and there's price, and you're supposed to label all your axes, otherwise you're a rotten kid. And here's the demand curve. Well, you know, then you'd uh, if if the price went down by one millionth of a percent, you would buy an infinite amount of stuff. Uh, <laughs> that's a problem. So you could draw the thing. It's easy to draw it. I just drew it, but. Um, uh, I, I don't think it makes much sense. Well, you know, there's something interesting that's related to this, Walter, which is the socialist calculation debate, which has been going around. And some people have been saying that artificial intelligence will give governments the ability to calculate just like profit and loss signals give private firms the ability. And they point to something huge like Walmart, which has come up earlier in our conversation and say, you know, they're so big. And they have so many departments and divisions and, and uh, you know, they're almost like the government of, let's say, a, not even a small country, maybe a medium sized country. And they are calculating internally, uh, despite on the wholly internal side of their balance sheet, you know, the profit and loss signals within them. So so I don't think AI solves the socialist calculation problem because I think it's about more than information. It's about skin in the game and profit and loss. But give us your thoughts there. Oh, yes, I certainly agree with you on that. Uh, you know, it, this is sort of part and parcel of that automation is going to take our jobs away. Right. Uh, machines so, so do so everything. Software is AI, and we've had software a long time. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's incentives, there's um, information, uh, there's continual changes. There are seven and a half billion people. Uh, you know, they start inventing super duper um, um, uh, AI machines that can do things for uh, all seven and a half billion of us. I mean, uh, even if it could, it, it, it would only scratch the surface. Yes, uh, AI is good. Uh, look, uh, we all benefit from computers. We couldn't be having this conversation 20, 30 years ago. Uh, we could have the conversation on the telephone, but we couldn't do it um, uh, the way we're now doing it through Zoom. So, you know, we have to be um, appreciative of AI, but that doesn't mean that it undermines, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, the central planning or socialist calculation debate. Uh, before we get off, I must draw you, uh, we must talk about the Rockefellers. Yes, sure. Must we, must we not? Because, okay. you know, when, pe uh, when people think of, um, Monopoly, they, they uh, think of Rockefeller as evil. So uh, is, is that okay if I get yeah, into so that? They for... also, but also they think of that era. They think of, let's say, uh, mid-1800s to early-1900s. So I think Rockefeller is an excellent example. The robber barons, uh, of which he is the most famous, but uh, there are robber barons in not only um, um, uh, refining oil, but, you know, just about sugar and, you know, copper, anything, railroads, whatever. So let me uh, now clear this and draw a picture of the United States. 
here's the United States. I have to draw up Long Island because that's where I'm from. And here's Florida. And here is Texas. And there's the United States. This looks like Dilbert. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the argument of the um, people who think that Rockefeller is evil is you have standard oil all over the place. And then you have independence, who I'll indicate with an X. And here's a, a standard oil and an X and a standard oil here. And there's an X and there's an X here and a standard oil. And uh, there, there are places all over the place where there are independence and uh, standard oil. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen is uh, standard oil is going to try to get rid of this Floridian competitor. How is he going to get rid of the Floridian competitor? He's going to charge prices way below cost. He's going to suffer a loss, but, uh, and how will he finance it? He'll get money from all these other standard oils that the X can't get because the X are independent. The X's are independent. So he's going to lower the price uh, and, and drive this guy out of business. And then guess what happens when this guy is driven out of the business? He raises his price uh, inordinately uh, to monopoly levels. And now he uh, goes over to here to um, Portland where they're having riots. And well, they weren't having riots then, but goes over to Portland or Seattle. And now uh, he finances the same sort of thing with all the money from these other S's and a lot of money from the Floridian one because the Floridian one mm -hmm. is uh, coining money hand over fist. And then he knocks out all the X's and he's a monopolist. And this is the theory that a lot of people believe. And this is absolute nonsense in, in so many, many ways. And one of the best articles uh, on this is a guy named John McGee in the Journal of Law and Economics. He's not an Austrian, but boy, oh boy, is he good on this one. And half of it is why it can't work. And the other half is what the history of it. And the history of it was, the reason Rockefeller did well is he could refine oil more cheaply and better than his competitors. Uh, so he had that advantage. And, and he goes into some of the people would set up X's just to be bought out by Rockefeller because Rockefeller, uh, it was easier for him to buy out another refinery and then uh, incorporate his own refining methods than to start a new one. Uh, and now why is it uh, dead from the neck up um, uh, intellectually? Well, First of all, it assumes all the X's are independent. Once this happens once, all the other X's are going to say, hey, look at what they did in Florida. They can do it to us. We got to, you know, uh, shape up. The second is, what about all the people that use lots of oil in Florida? Uh, and now when Rockefeller triples the price, they're not going to be happy campers. They'll subsidize the X if need be to keep the X guy going. But even that is, is only uh, touching the surface because what the X can do is say, look, I'm shutting down. I'm going to buy Rockefeller oil at half price and I'm going to store it in every silo and basement that I can. And meanwhile, Rockefeller is losing money hand over fist. And as soon as Rockefeller starts raising the price, I'll come back in and I'll have all of his oil and I'll start selling it. So the whole thing is nonsense. Uh, and uh, this is sort of a refutation. Uh, and I wanted to get this on record because the Rockefeller case is, um, you know, uh, prevalent among people who have the views on antitrust uh, other than our our views. Well, Walter, I, I want to go out on one last question, devil's advocate question. It's, it's akin to what you just drew, but let's take Google, which exists uh, electronically more than physically in terms of, uh, you know, gas stations or something like that. Supposedly, I don't know if this is true, but supposedly Google uh, owns about 90% of all search traffic. Um, and if Google were to come along and say, if you type in Mises or Rothbard or something like that into Google, they could disappear the Mises Institute by moving all of our search results to page 30 instead of page one or two where we want them. And so uh, wh however you define the industry, maybe if you're defining breakfast cereal, uh, you know, we ought to look at the larger industry of breakfast, which includes eggs and bacon and sausage, and you get into lots of other sellers and producers. But if you said search is really the industry... And globally, Google owns 90% of it. And in a certain sense, there are some barriers to entry. There's network effects. Uh, there's Google's size and its ability to snap up really top software people and top engineers and this and that. But these, these barriers to entry exist in any, in any uh, or, you know, industry, I suppose, to an extent. But give us your case to not worry about Google. Well, um, I do worry I about like Google, that. but not for monopoly reasons. 
Right. <laughs> I didn't because like I think that they, last. Because I don't like their I, politics. Right. Look, uh, Mises is hateful. I'm offended by uh, the Mises Institute because, you know, you free enterprise and that's fascism. Not only will they put you on page 30, maybe, uh, they'll obliterate you that, you know, uh, and this has happened. The Federalist Society has been downgraded. Uh, the president of the United States wants to get on Twitter and they don't want to get him on Twitter. The Twitter is a similar thing to Google uh, because he's hateful or offensive or whatever. I mean, th this is um, uh, problematic. So when you said it's not a problem, I'm, I, I'm sure you agree with me. It is a problem. But as you said, it's not a problem from a monopoly point of view. Uh, I'm glad we got this diagram here because we are all the X's. It's not just the Mises Institute, but it's uh, the Federalist Society, other conservative groups. There was this uh, woman, Amy Wax from Pencil Penn State or U University of Pennsylvania, who said some things that were offensive. By the way, I, I was almost fired from my job for being offensive with uh, voluntary slavery. Uh, the, the mainstream media, and it, not just um, uh, electronic, but print, you know, uh, Wall Street, uh, not Wall Street Journal, um, uh, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, uh, all of them, uh, see um, f economic freedom as fascism and as hurtful and harmful. And uh, you remember what happened at the New York Times where uh, somebody um, uh, uh, allowed Tom Cotton uh, to be on, uh, give a, an op-ed. And, yes. you know, Tom Cotton is a senator from uh, Arkansas, wanted to have federal troops come in, and this was deemed uh, horrible. Uh, so, yes, uh, the Rockefellers of the day or the, the, the left-wing media people are running rampant. Well, uh, is this um, uh, censorship? No, it's censorship because we define censorship as only government consent. They're not censoring. Look, you don't let everyone in the Mises Institute. I don't let everyone into my apartment. You know, you own the Mises Institute or you're the president of it and you only allow people who, who you want and same with my house or Loyola University only allows certain people in there. Uh, so we all have a right and uh, Google should have the right to not allow uh, hateful, offensive people like you and me if they if they want and not only put in us on page 31, but just uh, uh, off off the chart. Well, the all of these people are now starting to set up alternatives to Google. I, I, I forget the names of them. There, there are three or four of them. And, and as you mentioned, network effects, you don't really want three or four or five of them. You want them to have a cartel or a, a counter monopoly. And I'm using a monopoly here uh, improperly. But you want to have another uh, group, uh, uh, Schmoogle. And uh, Schmoogle would be uh, equal size to Google after a while, uh, because all the people that Google is kicking off or deprecating would uh, would uh, subscribe to Schmoogle. And uh, then that would be, I think, the solution to it. And I think it's already starting. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Chapter 10 of Man, Economy, and State. It deserves its own show. Groundbreaking stuff. Wish more economists would read it. Uh, very, very important, even in our current age. Plus, you get a little bonus. You get some video this week. You get some charts and diagrams. You get to see Walter Block's spare bedroom, which, of course, has books in it. And I want to remind you, you should be reading along with us. We have a code, H-A-P-O-D, which you can use at our website, at our store, to get a discount on this book in either paperback or beautiful hardcover form. You can also just go to Mises.org, type in Man, Economy, and State, and read it and search it on a very beautiful HTML page. Uh, which is going to let you go from chapter to chapter. So you don't need to spend any money, but you're going to enjoy this book a lot more if you're reading along with us going through it. Uh, we have a, a, a chapter coming up on money and banking. Then we're going to get into the power and market section of the book, which is really some of the sexy stuff about private defense and private police and that sort of thing. So, you know, get caught up, uh, get the book. This is one of those books you're going to want to own. And stay tuned as we uh, get through the next few chapters of Man, Economy, and State. Walter Block, I want to thank you so much. I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks. I just have to say one thing. Thanks for having me on this. And I remember the first time I read Manning Economy and State, I've read it maybe three times now, but the first time I read it, I had first met Murray and I'd read it all day. And then at night I'd see him and it really just blew my mind that, that uh, I, I mean, the guy is a genius. Uh, he, he's magnificent. And, and I was honored to be able to be his friend for many years uh, while reading this book. I first met him and uh, it's an experience I'll never forget. So thanks for having me on this show. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Walter. Have a great weekend. Take care.
The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.